to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. On today's episode, we are being joined by Major John Rain Waters. Rain, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be back and appreciate the time. Yeah, absolutely. So we had you on the show back in June of 2020, and you got to introduce yourself to the audience at that point, talk a little bit about your experience as an F-16 driver, being a Viper demo pilot, those kinds of things. But for those who haven't heard that episode, let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, give them a little bit of background about who you are, where you come from, how you got into the Air Force, and then we'll get into our conversation today. Yeah, the quick snapshot, which probably will turn into a long snapshot, is I commissioned through ROTC, went to Georgia Tech. I ended up going to pilot training in Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. They liked me so much, they kept me for about three years afterwards, and I instructed in the T-6 as a first assignment instructor pilot. Mm -hmm. In that time period, I actually deployed in the MC-12, which is a King Air, to Afghanistan doing intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Came back to the T-6 for a touch-and-go before I transitioned to F-16 where I spent basically the last five and a half years of my active duty time flying F-16, right. did a deployment in support of Operation Inherent Resolve, and then rounded out my active duty time as the F-16 demo pilot. Now I'm currently a reservist with a recruiting service, and I fly in the commercial world, flying the 777 all across cool. the globe. So, Yeah, and actually, uh, you are in Japan right now, yeah. <laughs> having done a number of those different kinds of flights, right? Yeah, it gets real screwy, right? Because I'm a day ahead. It's Friday here, you know? So yeah. when you're doing the time zone math, it's like some higher level math that I'm just not smart enough to figure out. So thank God for computers and other smart people, I guess. Yeah, but smart enough to fly the T6, the MC-12, the F-16, and now smart enough to be on the Commission Ed podcast. Yeah. <laughs> In that order, right? You know? Yeah. You found the bottom <laughs> of the barrel. Congrats. <laughs> No, Rain, we are super excited that you are here today, and we reached out to you for a very specific purpose. One, you are a friend of the show. Your podcast, the Afterburn Podcast, as well as Commission Ed, we are part of the same podcast network, BVR Podcast Network, along with the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Lower Level Hell. Want to give those guys a shout out and a plug, right? And so you're a friend of the show, but also we wanted to bring you onto the show today because of the experience that you identified that you are a veteran of Afghanistan, of the operations in Syria with inherent resolve. And that kind of leads the direction that we want to go today with our conversation. Here we are just about 20 years from the attacks on New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., as well as in Chinksville, Pennsylvania. We want to commemorate that and also talk to each other a little bit about how things have gone over the course of those 20 years and where we're at today. It's no surprise to anybody, unless you've been living under a rock, that things have been happening in Afghanistan with the withdrawal, and we will get to that here in a second. But that is the purpose of our conversation here today, is to reflect on 20 years since 9-11-2001, the global war on terror, during that time, how it has impacted us as American citizens, as professionals in the United States Air Force, as officers, and see if we can get after a little bit of the lessons learned, our hopes, our concerns for what's coming next as well. And really to set the stage for this, I want to share a letter that was sent out by the new Secretary of the Air Force, recently confirmed as the 26th Secretary. This is the Honorable Frank Kendall. In his letter there, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there is a paragraph that I want to share for the benefit of the audience. He says there to all airmen and guardians, we encourage you to talk with your fellow airmen, guardians, and joint teammates about your experiences. Really listen, hear their stories, and tell yours. 
and take care of one another. So I want to use that there to set the stage for the conversation that we are going to have today to talk about 20 years of conflict, the global war on terror, what's going on in the world at large, what's going on specifically in Afghanistan, and try to get after this opportunity for catharsis, to share our thoughts, our feelings, and work through everything that's going on right now. So with that, I want to bring everybody back 20 years ago, 9-11-2001. Where were we? Read the audience has actually already heard your story, but I want you to take the first crack at sharing where you were, what happened, what was your experience on that day? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Colin. So I was about six weeks shy of my 19th birthday. I had graduated high school and I was working for the local city where I went to high school for their parks and recreation department. So we took care of the parks, mowed the grass, took care of the bathrooms, did sprinklers, that kind of stuff. And every day, about nine in the morning, so we got started about six, we'd work for a few hours, and then we would have a mid-morning break and talk to the boss, kind of make a plan, watch the prices right, and then get about our day. And somebody came into the office, you know, we're watching prices right, and he like changed the channel. I mean, this is like sacrilege, mm. right? Yeah. You do not mess with the prices right at 9 a.m. break. And he's like, hey, I just heard something on the radio, and that was right about the time that the second tower was hit. And so we all knew something was really wrong. And I did in the previous episode, you know, talk about my feelings and how I felt powerless. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what to do. And I was sent to the cemetery, which the city owned, and I was asked to lower the flag to half staff. So that's where I was. You know, I was old enough to recognize that I could get drafted should mm -hmm. it go this way. I mean, I was just old enough. I wasn't sure what to do, and I didn't like that feeling. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, thanks, Reed. And if anybody wants to go back and hear your full experience with that, you shared it last year. That's episode 52. I encourage you all to go listen to that. It was a powerful moment, and really appreciated you taking the time to share that with us, Reed. So let's do the same thing for you, Rain. Where were you? 9-11-2001, what was your experience on that day? So I was still in high school. I was a junior in high school. And I had just finished first period and was walking to my second period class, which was history. And I had a good friend stop me in the hall on the way to my history class saying that a uh, plane had just hit the Twin Towers. So you're processing that and you're also thinking too, like, it's probably just an accident. What might have happened? Yeah. Not really knowing much. Get to my class. And that's when we find out a second plane hit the second tower. Now you know it's not an accident. So there's a lot of processing going on. I grew up in an aviation community, a lot of Delta pilots in that community. So there are a lot of my friends who are going to that school that dads flew for Delta. They had no idea. So some of those kids, you know, they really struggled because there was not a lot of information. They didn't turn the TVs on. But, you know, kind of fast forward, we figured out what was happening that day and we will learn we were under attack. Obviously, a lot of emotions that are riding high. I considered Hey, enlisting. I knew I wanted to fly, but I really wanted to get into the fight because right. I wanted to get back at the people who attacked us. So I'd say emotions were riding high. And that was, you know, kind of the beginning on the path that I'm on still today, you know? Yeah, for sure. That was a very similar experience for me. I was a high school sophomore and I remember driving to school that morning and turning on the radio in the early morning there and not hearing my usual rock radio music, right? And being super confused. Finally, you know, through the fog of like trying to wake up as a teenager in the early morning, realized what was going on. They were talking about this attack or this accident. Something happened in New York. And then I get to high school and every radio, every TV, in every classroom, anywhere you went, you couldn't escape it. It was there. And I don't even remember if like I was moving from class period to class period, because it was really just all the same thing. You would go into a classroom, you'd sit down and you'd watch the TV for the next hour. And so I got to watch on TV as the second plane hit the second tower. And just like you read that feeling of helplessness, wanting to do something, but not knowing what to do, what I can do, and being really uncomfortable with that, that feeling like I needed to do something. And I think that informed 
my next few years, it may have done the same thing for you both about the decisions I made over the next few years that as I went into college, I was very interested in serving my country. Yeah, I had my own personal goals of working in the space exploration and aerospace industry. I wanted to work for NASA, but there was that underlying, I want to serve my country. And so I joined ROTC. And of course, that was the crux of all of our training. That was the focus of everything that we did is that there was this global war on terror going, that there were men and women who had already been sent to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq. Because by the time I got into ROTC, you know, this was 2006. This is five years later. By the time I finally got my shot, I finally got to a point where I could do something. And it had all been informed by that previous moment of feeling like I wanted to do something, but I couldn't. Reed, describe that for yourself. What, how did the initiation of the global war on terror and the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan then shape your next steps? Yeah, it's interesting because I was just about to leave on a mission for my church for two years. I was headed to Spain, and it was constant and present in my experience there in Spain because if you recall, and maybe you guys don't because you weren't in a European country when this happened, but when we invaded Iraq just a few years later, 2003, the Spanish government wanted to align themselves with the allies. If you recall, George Bush, the president at the time, gave a big speech, mm -hmm. right? Either you're with us or you're against us. Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, this axis of evil, you know, these are pretty important moments. Well, I don't know how many are aware, but there is a terrorism problem in northern Spain, which is where I was. This terrorist group called ETA, they're Basque nationalists. Yep. And now there's Barcelona and the Catalonia. They want to be their own nation as well, but they're not killing cops over it, which is something that ETA would do. They would blow things up. And so the president of Spain decided to align with the United States in order to get training, money, and to you know align with this, hey, we don't like terrorism thing. And his own people were furious about this, furious about this. And there were protests in the streets. And I got letters from the State Department saying, hey, you're an American living in a foreign country. You need to not go outside, you know, because this anti-American sentiment was really strong. Yeah. And then right after I left the country, there was a terrorist attack in Madrid on a train. And it killed a lot of people. And it actually swayed the election from the existing president who was trying to fight terrorism because the terrorists who blew up the train said it's because you're in the Middle East fighting and it swayed an election. And so my experience was very geopolitical. You know, I was seeing kind of the back and forth between countries and their decisions and how that was impacting things. And then I started five or six years of school and the military had always been there, but it really wasn't front and center for me. I got married and I was trying to be a scientist. I went to ROTC to kind of say, hey, I'm interested. They're like, yeah, but you can't be a scientist. We need you to be an engineer. And I'm like, nope, that is not how this works. Because <laughs> I had just about killed myself to get a C in calculus. <laughs> and I, and, you know, I'm staring, you know, five, six years of math. And I'm like, no, this isn't going to work. So it was always there, this desire to serve, this desire to do something. But it was just kind of in the background. Fast forward to 2009, financial collapse, Reed can't find a job. And a buddy of mine's like, hey, I'm thinking of joining the Air Force. And it just reignited all of those feelings. Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually commission until 2011. So we're talking nearly 10 years. April of 2011 is when I finally felt like I was in it. And then, you know, and we'll talk about this. I immediately, in my very first jobs, started looking at not global war on terrorism targets. I was always looking at strategic targets at... Mm -hmm. What we are now looking at with the national defense strategy, the two plus three, what we call hard targets, nation states with real air forces and real counter air equipment, you know, surface to air missiles, those types of things. So yeah, it was kind of an interesting thing. I felt like my experience of 9-11 kind of pushed me to think about the military, but then the military never drove me that way for a very long time. Yeah. And until very recently, hasn't. You know, very recently, meaning your deployments that you've had, those were the only things that really enabled you to participate in the global war on terror. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So my first few years, it was, you know, all hard targets. I was sent to Hawaii, which we weren't looking at Afghanistan. We were looking at Indo-PACOM. Yeah. And, you know, Korea and China are the big targets there. And then I did deploy to the Middle East and we've talked extensively about that on the podcast. And that was it pretty much. Yeah. You know, those six months, incredibly concentrated, you know, rain before we started recording, you know, I probably built mission plans for you and your brothers and sisters to go fly over Kobani, you know, like it's a crazy small world. But again, I got back and then it was all hard targets again. And so it's been a really it's a constant presence. It's always there. It's always on my mind, but the military has always directed me other ways. And it's been an interesting experience to feel kind of torn, you know, like yeah. my brothers and sisters are bleeding and dying over here and want to be involved, but also recognizing the greater threat and focusing on that as well. So that's right. kind of where I find myself these days. Yeah. It's a really interesting thing to think about how the main driver for you to want to get into the military was the attacks on 9-11 and then finally get in and not be able to do much about that because there were these other things that were of strategic necessity to the United States and our interests, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we're seeing that emphasis now, and I know we'll talk more about it, but it's, and that experience is not unique. You know, we had Captain Jopling on a few weeks ago, security forces, similar experience. He joined because he wanted to get in the fight. And then they had him guarding ICBMs in yeah. Montana. Very strategic target, right? We're not going to nuke terrorists in the desert. Like, that's not what those are for. Those are for deterring other nation states with nuclear weapons, which yeah. China, Russia, right? That's, and so he never got a deploy, hmm. even though that's why he, you know, so it's not a unique experience. And it's a challenging thing to be subject to the whims of the state. But we know that when we sign up. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah, Rain, let's give you the same opportunity to speak to how that moment, the attacks on 9-11, the ensuing global war on terror, how did that then shape your next 20 years, your personal and your professional life? You know, the thing is, I knew right about that time, probably a few years earlier, like I wanted to go and fly. And I looked at the Air Force, I was surrounded by former ex-Air Force and Navy guys. So I knew that was an option. 9-11 happened and it really was head down. Now this is, I'm going to make this happen. Yeah. So really just kind of dug in and did everything I needed to do to get into ROTC. And then once I was in ROTC, I knew I wanted to fly. So I did everything I needed to do in order to get a pilot slot. But it's like you said, right place, right time. You know, in the end, I had, I think, pretty good timing. But when I was a FAPE, the whole reason I joined, right, was to go out there and get back at the people who, you know, attacked us on 9-11. And I deployed in 2011, 2012 for the first time. So almost a decade after 9-11 yeah. was the first time I got to deploy. And honestly, I was kind of excited to do it because at that time, like Afghanistan was kind of winding down. Iraq was mm-hmm. winding down. So I was like, I'm not going to get an opportunity to go out there and do it. Little did I know that ISIS would pop up. We can talk about that later. But it's one of those things that I knew once it happened and you kind of let the dust settle around all the emotions from that day that I was able to kind of recage and focus on like the long range goal for me, which was still to serve, but I wanted to fly if I could do it, you know, two birds, one stone. Again, it was just a little bit longer of a path to get in there. And, you know, as you said, there's been mentioned, I've talked about on my podcast, like there are some guys who just don't have good timing. If we say good timing with air quotes right. about deploying, right? Like if you want to deploy, like you might show up to a squadron and they're gone or they're leaving in a month and you don't have enough time to spin up. By the time they come back, you integrate into the squadron well, when it's time for that squadron to recycle out, like you're probably PCSing. So there's several guys who go their entire career and they never really get an opportunity to deploy. And then there are others who they go every single time. I got a buddy who in the same fighter squadron as a lieutenant, a captain, a major, and now a lieutenant colonel, he's deployed, mm-hmm. which is super rare, right? But it just kind of depends. But yeah, for me, that was kind of, hey, I know what the end goal is. I got to push towards it and go after it. Yeah, absolutely. Timing is such an interesting thing. We have no control over it, and yet it really dictates so much of what our experiences are going to be. And one bit of timing that really affected me, and Reed, you are part of this too, 
is well so my first deployment in 2013 was to al Udeed. this is you know just a regular rotation just get over there support operation iraqi freedom that was an oif type thing because as you said rain afghanistan was winding down and all of our focus was still there on iraq went there it was basically steady state exactly what you would do at home station but away from my family and really hot and dusty right <laughs> that, that was my experience there at Al-Udeed. But getting back on the topic of timing, this one is really interesting because in the end of 2014, I had a, another captain in my squadron who had been pegged for a deployment, but then also had orders to PCS to basically his dream job. He was going to go work for a CAG at McGuire in New Jersey. He was super excited about it. But if he took the deployment, he was going to miss out on that PCS because he was going to miss his arrival date. And I already knew at that point that I was going to separate from the Air Force. I wanted to do one more HUA kind of thing. And so I told him, hey, man, I'll take it. I'll take your deployment because I'm going to separate as soon as I get back and everything's going to be fine. And so that was December of 2014. I volunteered for this deployment. And oh, I should say that the deployment was going to be to Azraq, Jordan, Wufak Salty Air Base in Jordan. And in February of 2015, ISIS captured the Jordanian pilot and put him in a cage, set him on fire for the whole world to see. And I remember texting you, Reed, and saying, hey, man, this is where I'm going. I'm going to Jordan. What can you tell me? Are things going to change? Am I going to be safe? I didn't know. Yeah. And I was deployed when that happened. And it was interesting because, Colin, when I told you I was going to a Qatar, you're like, oh, here's my, you know, 15 page document of how to have a great <laughs> deployment. Yeah. And all my train up, all my spin up was we're shutting down Afghanistan. That was it. Mm -hmm. That was everything we were focused on was shutting down Afghanistan. And I get there and I'm controlling aircraft over Iraq, you know, five hours after I've landed. Yeah. Because, oh, while I was waiting for my rotator is when ISIS rolled into Iraq. I mean, that's how immediate it changed. And yeah, I remember this conversation because at the time it was like, I don't know. And that's what, exactly what yeah. you told me. It's like, <laughs> I don't know, Colin. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. And my wife is like, what's going to happen? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Timing, right? The people who were there before me were bored. They had two days off. They had two days off a week. I didn't have that problem. <laughs> you know, it was or that luxury or that luxury. Yeah. Depending on how you want to look at I it. I did get time off, but you know, it's not nearly as bad as, you know, those who are, you know, boots on ground and, and really getting after it. But yeah, you can't control that kind of stuff. Colin, did you deploy there or did you make it there? Yeah. So I ended up in Wufak Salty Air Base just outside Azraq, Jordan. I was there 2015 from March to August. Here we go. Full circle, small world. Right. I left in April. So yeah, there you go. So we overlapped <laughs> by like a month then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So Rain, tell us about your experience there. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's like we showed up, we were going to deploy to Jordan basically as a training deployment, show a presence in the region, you know, and June of 2014, ISIS popped up on the map and that was a new thing, right? And then the world was kind of taken aback at how fast they ripped through Syria and Iraq. and just the horrific stuff they were doing and how effective they were at capturing, taking, murdering, terrorizing. So the unit we replaced, you know, read, you know, those guys were doing the same thing we were planning on doing. They were doing training. And then overnight they get thrown into fights on. Yeah. You're having to defend the embassy in Baghdad, Mosul Dam. And it's kind of funny. I was talking to my former commander on a podcast about Afghanistan, this very thing. And, you know, one of the jokes, like the lineup cards, like you don't think about like our steer points in F-16. At home, you're probably using steer points like one through 20. There's 999 available to you. But you would think like, hey, we're gonna have our diverts in the 70 series or the 90 series, kind of everything organized, right? Those guys never had an opportunity 
to really do that. It was literally like overnight go. So when we got there, there's a lot of cleanup items that even we didn't get to until we're a couple months into the deployment. Some of the basics, because it was so busy and the ops tempo was so fast and so furious that, you know, you're just like hanging on. And again, we were kind of talking about the lead up, you know, we knew like, hey, June, this might be happening. July, it really kicks off and we're out the door at the end of September. There's a whole slew. We're in a, in a block 50 unit, you know, our primary mission sets, defensive counter air, suppression of enemy air defenses. We were planning on going over to Jordan, still being able to do some of that training, putting people through upgrades. Doing close air support is not one of those things that we practiced all the time. It was a, hey, in case we need to go, we're going to spend the whole squadron up, which is what we did. But, you know, it requires two to three sims per pilot, probably four to six flights, night flights. There's just a ton of training that has to get done when you start multiplying that by X number of pilots, X number of jets. So yeah, interesting time. And you know, we go back to timing, right? This is the full circle. So on the day that the Jordanian pilot went down and he was captured, our wing weapons officer was the mission commander for that mission. He takes off and has to airboard, returns to base, gets in a jet, takes off again, has to airboard again, like perfect storm. Unfortunately, the only people, other American assets on that strike mission that day, really Raptors, right? And they're, they don't have targeting pods and they're from the Bozosphere. So when it went down, he didn't have a whole lot of support. But that weapons officer, again, the most tactical dude I know, probably the smartest tactician I know when it comes to, especially the F-16, that was his first deployment, right? Because he was that guy, right? Who just wrong place, wrong time. Again, if we say that with air quotes. So again, small world, but you can kind of see how it plays into. Yeah, and what I remember from that, I showed up after the initial response to the immolation of the Jordanian pilot, which that attack, that response was led by the King of Jordan. Freaking awesome, right? So cool that, yeah. that he would do that. But what I remember there in Jordan and basically all that I then knew about Syria was just go, 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 go. I remember going into the DFAC and seeing you pilots over on the one side and y'all just looked exhausted. Like <laughs> blank stare, <laughs> just, it just looked like you guys never stopped. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was a busy deployment. You know, unfortunately, we lost pyro on that deployment about a month and a half into it. You know, it's that weight yeah. heavy on the squadron. And then by the end of it, and actually during that, we call the Jordanian Revenge, I had actually four deployed to another location. And I was like the last guy to leave with a bunch of our maintainers. So, you know, I watched that via text message and things like that from, again, another spot. But hearing about it afterwards is pretty incredible. But I know, like, I know personally when it came to April and going home, like, all I wanted to do beforehand was just, like, get in the fight. Yeah. And you're like, if I can just, like, drop one bomb, as silly as it sounds, like, I'll be happy. But, like, by the end of it, everyone had their sufficient fill of it. Yeah. And you're like, I'm good. I, I just... remember going into the, the op center <laughs> and seeing the, the, the bombs painted on the wall. Yeah. You know, like, counting how many had been dropped, and the whole wall was just covered. This may be apocryphal. Maybe you can confirm that it's true that more bombs were dropped in those six months than in like the entire, you know, all the rotations previous to that. So up to that point, so we dropped the most precision guided weapons of any F-16 unit. Okay. Our counterparts in the Strike Eagle squadron, another base, same deal. And then it was just subsequently beat every single yeah. unit that rotated in there. You know, Gulf War, they were dropping six Mark 84s like per jet and they would hot pit go do it again, yeah. go do it again. So you can't beat the dumb bombs, but a lot of weapons employment was happening for sure. You know, I can't tell you probably how many Humvees and excavators our unit <laughs> destroyed, you know, but yeah, again, maybe it's foreshadowing what's going to happen again. You just never know. Yeah. I know for sure, you know, at that specific time, right at the peak of all of this, I was actually in the combat plans division of the AOC. So embedded with, you know, a representative from just about every aircraft, I was the ISR planner, making sure our plans integrated well with the entire plan. And the gas guys were also up there, you know, making the whole yeah. plan for refueling. Mm -hmm. And every single brief, it was a new record. Yeah. The amount of gas they were going to offload every single day. It was a new record. And yeah, we absolutely took liberties with putting as many aircraft up. You know, if they were going to present targets, we were going to action them. And yeah. it's funny, that that was something that was really interesting for me to see. You know, I had been very 
focused on hard targets, right? We'd already kind of talked about that. I deploy and most of what we had been doing for that previous, you know, 10, 12 years was dynamic targeting. We didn't have, you know, designated known locations where we were going to go blow stuff up. It was all reactionary. It was all close air support, that type of thing. The first strikes in Syria were deliberate targeting. We had a bunch of known locations. We had a bunch of places and things that we wanted to eliminate from the map. And I was a little worried. I'm like, you know, I don't know that we haven't done this in a while. And I had been in exercises where we'd done deliberate targeting. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know that this is going to go super well. Uh -huh. um, we're really good at deliberate targeting. You guys are efficient. Precision guided munitions are good. And we ran out of stuff to blow up in a day or two. Yeah. Because we are really good at that. And so that was kind of an interesting experience, you know, coming from Paycom, being worried about deliberate targeting, and then actually doing it in real life. It simultaneously made me very happy. I'm like, ooh, we're good at this. We haven't quite lost this skill. But then it also made me think, you know, are we going to do this when we're also getting shot at? Because that's still a different thing. Very different. You know, is we owned the air. And that's something that I still think about all the time. What's it going to be like in the future when we don't own the airspace? Yeah, 20 years of basically uncontested environment. Not that it makes you lazy, right? But because everyone's thinking about it. I know it's in the forefront of the guys training out there today. It was in the forefront of our minds when I was out there training, right? Like, it's nice when you can fly around and you're not worried about someone shooting at you. Being, you know, a wild weasel, that's where you spend a lot of your bread and butter, like escorting strikers into a good day, you know, if you can have an air-to-air -air missile harm and a bomb coming off your jet all at the same time, like you're winning. But there's some really advanced threats out there that would make life very complicated and very challenging if we had to go knock down doors in certain places. Yeah. And Colin, that's probably a good time for us to transition, you know, like our conversation. What are we thinking about now? You know, we're experiencing this challenging withdrawal from Afghanistan. We've all seen the images. You know, we've seen the C-17s just loaded to the gills with people trying to take off as they're surrounded by additional people trying to leave Afghanistan. We've seen the press releases. We've seen people be grumpy. We've seen in our own units people struggling with this experience. You know, my dad, he was in high school when Saigon fell. Mm -hmm. So he missed, air quotes, right, missed Vietnam, but he was right in that age where he could have gone had it really held out maybe a year or two more. And he certainly had friends who went over there. Yeah. This is our Saigon. I mean, the images are similar. The emotional strain is similar. And Rain, we're going to definitely rely on you because Afghanistan's not my war. I didn't go there. And that's something Colin and I talked a lot about as we've gone through this. You know, we were focused elsewhere. And so, you know, there's a lot rolled up into this. We've got big enemies we're really worried about, we're focusing on, but we can't deny what is this experience of this withdrawal and everything that's going on. So what are your thoughts on, on kind of where we are and where we're headed? Well, a couple of things that caveat one, you know, first and foremost, like I only deployed to Afghanistan once, you know, there are people who deployed multiple times. So, you know, again, I'm not the most experienced person to talk about it, but I do have like everyone opinions about it. And the second piece is, this is like a very politicized and politically charged topic. So my goal is not to be political. You know, if we talk about like a red flag exercise or a large force exercise that doesn't go well, it ends in blue players dying. We're going to debrief that, right? Like the gloves come off and the debrief and you dissect it. Now, this is obviously a much different level as far as who's involved. So overall, like looking at this, if we talk about the end, this is not the end you hope for. Yeah. Now, at some point, like this needed to come to a close of some magnitude, right? Maybe there was a presence in there. I don't have those answers. The last couple of weeks have obviously, you know, in my humble opinion, again, which doesn't really matter too much, has been like a complete debacle. So what you would normally do is like debrief that so you don't do that. Like what were the mistakes we made? What were the contributing factors? What was the root cause that led to the scenarios that we've seen, you know, play out? So with that, you know, when you think about it is, 
you know, broad brush, right? Was this all for naught? You know, did people die in vain? And I personally don't believe so. I know a lot of people are struggling with this. And I think it's one thing is it's good to talk about. There have already been guys who've committed suicide and it's been attributed to this very factor. So it's important to talk about because, you know, for 20 years, we haven't had a terrorist attack on US soil, which maybe would have happened, maybe it wouldn't have happened. So I think by keeping the enemy at bay while we went in there, we did that, right? I have a lot of concern now with the way we exited because as we talked about in our experiences with OIR, one of the issues that reared its ugly head was the fact that the Iraqi army crumbled, that a lot of weapons, a lot of vehicles were captured by ISIS, right? Again, I don't have all the details. I'm just going off open source information in the news. So take it with a grain of salt, right? But we do know that, you know, the Taliban, which they're not our friends, right? We might be dealing with them. There's a lot of weaponry that has been left behind. There's a lot of equipment that's been left behind that I do think is, in my best guess, is going to present a security concern at a minimum in that region, if not for us on a larger scale, right? At some point it will. Yeah. So that does give me concern. But then as Reed said, it's like, there are a lot of threats and there's a lot of people that don't like the U.S. and our allies in the world, right? They don't like the freedom we have. So we must remain vigilant. And there's definitely big nation state players that require a lot of attention and focus on our behalf. And I do think it is one of those things at some point we needed to pivot and we really need to start focusing on, you know, contested environments. People dog on the F-35, right? They're like, it's not the A-10. It can't replace the A-10. The A-10 is an amazing plane. It's an amazing close air support platform. Like I want to shoot the gun, but the A-10, the F-16, those are not your planes you're going to utilize in a contested environment. So we have to realize and we have to pivot and we have to focus. So that's a long roundabout way of kind of initial smattering with what's going on in Afghanistan, but also the world stage. And there's a lot of problems that have to be solved. The main thing is when we mess something up or when something doesn't go right the way it's supposed to, we need to debrief that to make sure that we don't make those same mistakes later on, right? And they can translate across whatever battle space it might be. So Rain's humble opinion. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts, Rain. And just to pile on to that a little bit, if I may, I'm not a veteran of Afghanistan. I never deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. I did deploy. I supported operations to those different locations, but my experience obviously is limited. That said, as you can see from our discussion here, the global war on terror has very much informed the last 20 years of my life, which I'm 36 years old now. And so that is the majority of my life Yeah, has been the global war on terror. And so seeing this less than stellar exit from Afghanistan, it affects me, even though I was never there. And I can only imagine for those who were there, how much more it's going to affect them. That all said, I think that I'm in a place where I can recognize that we do need to pivot away from the global war on terror. We accomplished the things that we set out to do a long time ago. I mean, how many times have we said just in this podcast that Afghanistan and Iraq were drawing down? And yet yeah. it just continued to be a thing. I feel very strongly that while the global war on terror was important in its time and place, there are now more important things that we need to focus our attention on. So let's acknowledge it. Let's reason together. Let's say, yes, global war on terror was important in its time. Yes, we screwed up the departure from Afghanistan. And now let's move on and start working on the things that matter more. I think the one thing, though, we do have to recognize is, you know, the global war on terror, it will never be over, in my opinion. So true. You know, once we... You know, it, it'd be the same deal, right? Like I try to put myself in their shoes, right? If someone came to my house and took my dad or if a bomb dropped and killed my cousin, right? I mean, civilian casualties happened. Any of like right or wrong viewed as crusaders. Like we can just make that assumption that a lot of people were not happy with us being there. Yeah. So there's still a lot of people that don't like us. So I think we, unfortunately, it's like once you kick the hornet's nest, there's no putting it back. So... I think we have to acknowledge it's like the scary part to me is, yeah, we had this abysmal withdrawal. Got it. You know, we kept presence in places for decades, right? Like we've been in places for, I mean, even centuries. 
keeping a presence to do it. Maybe Afghanistan is that, maybe it's not. I do have concern that we'll see something that looks very similar to what ISIS did in Iraq and Syria with a power vacuum. Yeah. There's a power vacuum that's happening right now. But yeah, not to say, I absolutely 100% agree. It's kind of like, we kick this hornet's nest, this thing is going to keep burning. We have to like manage it and contain it. So maybe it's like, you know, putting a concrete lid on Chernobyl, right? Contain it. And then we do have to pivot and focus on big strategic players because key near peers have been making big moves over the past decade, if not more, and they're accelerating in their progress. And I think you guys can attest to read for sure. Like the strategic landscape is going to look very different in five years and 10 years that I think most people realize. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm not very smart, but that's my guess. Yeah. I think you're bringing up really good points, Rain and Colin as well. I think it's helpful to think about Simon Sinek's work, The Infinite Game. Colin, I think we've described that before on this podcast. Yep. The idea being finite games have a beginning, an end, agreed upon rules, known players, and it's, you know, a football game is a finite game. Infinite games have ill-defined players, ill-defined rules, no beginning or end, and the point of the game is to keep playing. <laughs> and war is not always a finite game. Right. And if the idea is to stay in the game, to continue to exist as a nation, we have to turn our attention to the things and the nations and the adversaries that have a greater potential of kicking us out of the game. What's the nearest alligator to the boat? What's going to kill me first, right? And that can change. Yeah. And that's exactly right. Rain, you give the analogy of kicking the hornet's nest. We're going to get stung. It's going to happen. Yeah. But we have to accept that risk as we turn and face toward the bear that is charging toward us. Yeah. Right? What is more dangerous? the hornet nest that you just kicked or the bear that's coming to eat you. Yeah, 100%. And two, right? And I think we've both said it for the time and place. I don't want anyone to kind of leave, you know, our discussion saying, should we not have gone into Afghanistan? I don't think we're questioning that at all. No. But it's time. And it's hard. It's hard. And it's okay for it to be hard for us and for those that we you know, bleed and serve with, it's okay. And, and I'm glad that we're talking about it because hopefully it'll spur some other conversations. You know, just the other day, walked in the squadron and saw this group of four or five airmen standing around. And I just said, hey, how are you guys doing with all this? And they said, that's actually what we're here talking about. You know, there's five of them just sitting there trying to just kind of express their feelings about what's going on. And I think that's healthy and good because if we don't do that, it leads to a lot of problems. And the Vietnam generation has shown us that. And for that, I'm grateful that they can kind of lead us through this experience. I think you make a good point, right? Is yeah, It's been obviously very prominent in the news the past couple of weeks, right? And it's like an abysmal failure, right? But the exit, yeah, I think we all can agree upon that. But we had a lot of like good wins throughout that. And honestly, like, you know, it's not over. There are a lot of smart individuals. There are a lot of tools in the tool bag, if you will, that will, I think, keep things at bay. It might just be more surgical and not upfront, which probably the right thing as we focus energy into closer alligators and bigger alligators. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, we have just a couple minutes left and I don't want to end on the low note. I mean, <laughs> we eventually got to some positive things there. So we will eventually bring things back up, but real quick in the couple minutes that we have left, Rain, I want to hear from you first. What are some of your concerns for the future with near peer competition, with accelerate change or lose? What is it that you are most worried about? Well, I think, I mean, it's very simple. It's near peers, and we have some near peers that are growing in capability and strength, as well as they're strategically expanding their reach and reaching further into nations all across the globe that we might have either taken for granted that would never happen. We'd always be able to go in there. So I think we're going to see the landscape from supply lines, logistics are going to be challenged. And we have competition in the market for that now to when it goes head to head, you now have adversaries that have capabilities that are very challenging to and match our equipment or our capabilities. So with that, I think it's just acknowledging the fact that 
there are other people who would like to be on at the top of the pyramid, right? Or would like to be the superpower and would like to be the governing body mm -hmm. and the influence on the world stage. So acknowledging that and realizing that it's not just always what we want to do. And COVID is a prime example, again, like at a unclassified level that I think everyone can feel the effects of, right? Everyone has felt the effects of supply chain limitations. Yeah, They have felt the effects of businesses, labor, these things shutting down and can probably get just like a little bit of a taste of what some things might happen when you go head to head with a near peer adversary and they exist out there. Yeah. So I think it's something to be cognizant of. Yeah. Reed, what are your thoughts? What are you worried about? Yeah. The thing that I'm most worried about is that in the last previous great power competition, post World War Two, there were pretty clear lines. Everybody knew who the bad guys were. Mm -hmm. And everyone was generally on board. And this is again, right, me looking back on history. You know, I didn't grow up during this era, I can't speak authoritatively, but it appears to me that it was very clear who the adversary was, and that the nation as a whole was on board with that idea. Soviet Union, communism, these are not things we want to support. And we're okay with, you know, how we're countering that. And as a result of that support, the entire whole of government was able to row with one purpose and one meaning in one direction against this adversary for a, a sustained amount of time. Yeah. I fear that too many of the people in this country don't even know that we are in an almost identical scenario, but they haven't defined an enemy. They haven't defined an adversary. And you've got my friends and I doing everything we can, jumping on desks, screaming fire in the theater, and it doesn't seem that that message is getting there. It feels like there may be some momentum building in that direction. I just, I'm worried that we're not going to get moving in the right direction quickly enough. And it's little things like Huawei trying to move into an area, and the government's like, no, we're not going to do this. And the average you know, John and Jane American don't understand why that matters. They don't understand what's the big deal. What's the big deal with TikTok? Why do I care? The list goes on of ways that, as you described, Rain, adversaries are trying to change the world order with their perspective, with their control, with their attitudes and beliefs. And we don't want that. <laughs> and it's not that we have to be in charge, but we want people that believe the same things that we do, that feel the same ways we do about freedom and liberty and all those, you know, core ideas. They don't believe in those things. In fact, they're antithetical to the positions we have. And so I think that's the biggest thing I'm worried about is we haven't clearly defined it quickly enough. And, and I just hope we can get moving in the right direction in time. Reed, I think you really hit on a point there that is something if you could imagine if the Soviets had access to the vast amount of data that every American puts out or every you know, person in the globe puts out on social media, right? Vast amounts of information. And for those who, again, would go open source, like watch the social dilemma on Netflix, right? A very basic, again, US companies engineering through algorithms, the information, the content that you get fed. Like adversaries are capitalizing on the information that's out there, right? And creating social discontent inside a nation is a very effective way at driving your point home, whatever objectives you're trying to meet without even firing a shot. So I think that's something too, that's a really good point. Like Cold War days, it was us versus the Soviets and everyone was on board. Today, it's much more murky and I think it'll be much more challenging to get everyone going the same way because Undoubtedly, there are influences that are occurring every single day to the content you're consuming, to the things you're doing, whether you know it or not, that might be influenced by a nation state, maybe by a corporation, maybe by a corporation that is receiving money from a nation state, maybe not, right? But a very different time than it was during the Cold War. And I think that's going to present some unique challenges. So it is scary. That's a really good point. What are you thinking about, Colin? Well, exactly that. The idea that we will be in a war and that nobody's going to even know about it. We are. 
Well, I know, I know that. (laughs) I know that. (laughs) Yeah. But that's the point. That's exactly what we're discussing here is that there is a war going on with our near peer rivals. It's not a hot war in the kinetic terms, right? But do the American people even know? Because of things like fake news, cancel culture, this ability to manipulate the things that you see, your curated, I'm using air quotes, curated content, because of those algorithms that are not human and are therefore very easily hacked. But even the human can be hacked. And we're seeing that play out all over the place. And so I fear this weaponization of society and culture and the tools that we try to use on a day-to-day basis just to live our normal lives being used against us. And knowing that that war is taking place here and now on our own soil gives me the jitters. But then knowing that because of who we're dealing with in China and Russia and the capabilities that they have, that any sort of kinetic fight that we get into with them is not going to happen over there, but has every ability to happen here. So the war is happening right now, and it is here, but not a shooting war. But the shooting war could very easily come here. And that's something I'm worried about. All right. Well, we definitely need uppers right now. Let's not leave it there, right? (laughs) We we got (laughs) to leave it there. So what are our hopes? What is it that we feel like, what gives you hope for the future? I'll go first. I've talked about this before, that there is hope in the good people who are Americans. Americans in general are good people. And then you slice that down even further. Those who want to join the military are generally good people. High moral character, very competent, want to serve each other and the American people, and then slice it down even more down to folks like us here, not saying that the way that this is going to get solved, not that we're the solution for everything, not that we're the best people, but the level of character that is in the Air Force officer and the level of competence and their earnest desire for good connection and leadership with their airmen and the civilians that they work with, that gives me hope. Our Air Force is not perfect. We know that. We talk about all the time how it can be improved. But knowing of the changes and the things that are in progress within the Department of the Air Force, the Air Force and the Space Force, that gives me hope. What do you think, Reed? Yeah, here, here. I liked your thoughts. I appreciate it. Two things. We have leaders who have called it and said the baby is ugly. That gives me hope. I get way more concerned when leaders are like, oh, no, everything's going to be fine. You know, think of the dog in the burning bar meme, right? Like, this is fine. That's not happening. And I think of Accelerate, Change, or Lose, General Brown stating very clear, black and white, we are going to lose people at the rates we haven't seen since World War II. You know, he is saying these things out loud. That gives me hope. And the second thing that gives me hope is that our adversaries are, like you said, Colin, using our institutions, our press, all these liberties that we have and using them against us. And to that, I say, okay, if you want to play with freedom, we're going to lean in. I feel like that's a double-edged sword. Okay, so you think freedom of the press is a bad thing and you're going to use it to confuse people. Okay, well, we're just going to continue to lean in. And we're going to be more open and more transparent. And, oh, maybe we'll find some things that aren't going so well in your country, China, Uyghurs, you know, the list goes on, right? So I feel like because some of the things that we do, some of the core tenets of what we have, we find those things to be true. I feel like if we just lean into those things instead of running away, instead of clamping down, instead of, you know, restricting the freedom of the press and other things like that, I feel like if we just lean in, and double down, I feel like it's going to be okay. So those are the kind of things that give me hope right now. Awesome. Thanks, Reed. Rain, last word over to you. What has you hopeful for the future? You know, the fact that there are a lot smarter people than me out there, which is not saying much, but I have a lot of buddies who are still active duty. A lot of people that I work with, several general officers who have a lot of respect for, who are still fully engaged in this. People that I, you know, trust implicitly. And they're good at solving complex problems. I would say our deployment to Jordan, while it was not as complex as going to fight a near peer, 
it was as streamlined as it could have been. And we went essentially more or less, it was Air Force bare bones, right? Base, but the efficiency that everyone was able to operate in an environment that we had not been there. You know, normally guys were deploying to bases like Bagram and Balad and Kandahar, well-established spots, right? And this wasn't that case, but seeing the adaptability, because being adaptive to dynamic situations is a strength that we possess that other countries don't necessarily do. And I've seen it firsthand and some of my travels were just a simple problem set requires a very, very complex routing of requests of information for someone to make a decision, you know, something that you'd say, nope, go do that. And it takes 20 people to make the decision. And that translates into the way they fight and things like that. So I do think we have a lot of smart individuals out there who are focused and their eyes on the ball and they realize that this is a threat. They realize the threat's out there and they're working behind the scenes. It's not going to be out there in the open of what they're doing. It's not going to be broadcast, which it shouldn't be. But I know people are out there and they're working to make sure that we're standing guard and the walls are up. We're going to take a few licks. But in the end, there are people dedicated to making sure we don't lose. Yeah, absolutely. And just to kind of dovetail that and round that thought out, the next war or the current war that we are in, if you will, is going to be won by the best led military. So let that sink in and let that become part of your motivation for whatever comes next. A continuation of GWAT, near peer competition, it doesn't matter what the enemy looks like, what they're capable of, what they're doing to us, know this, that the best led military is going to win. Let that be us, right? There's no reason why that couldn't be us. So on that final note there, Rain, we ask the question here on the podcast at the end of every show, what does it mean to be an officer? I'm gonna ask this to you again, which you've answered previously, but I want you to put it into that context, the future war. What does it mean to be an officer in the future, regardless of GWAT, near peer competition, whatever comes? What does it mean to be an officer? Yeah, softball, huh? Real easy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it doesn't change, right? As an officer, you're a leader. It doesn't matter. If your primary job is being a pilot, if you're an intel officer, ultimately boils down to is you being a leader. And when it becomes a leader, you'll be faced with different challenges. In World War II, it's different than what we're facing today. And it'll be different. Whoever's listening to this, getting ready to go through ROTC or the academy and become an officer, they're going to face different things. But realizing that it's your job to be a leader, to make the decision, right? And there's a lot that goes into that. It's not necessarily you're the king of the castle or queen of the castle. Realizing that you might not be the smartest person in the room. Hopefully you surround yourself with the smartest people, but taking inputs, making decisions, leading people through problem sets to come out to solutions, recognizing when things don't go right, debriefing those so you don't make those same mistakes twice. It's tough to surmise just being an officer and a leader in one foul swoop, but if you had to do it in the end, you're going to be leading people and making decisions that affect lives, that affect nations other people. It's a big responsibility. And every decision has some kind of ramification, whether you realize it or not. So you must dedicate the appropriate time amount of resources and thoughtfulness to those type of decisions, I think. Thank you so much, Rain. Couldn't agree more. Reed, anything else? No, man, that was great. Super glad you could join us today. And thanks for, you know, being that Afghan expert <laughs> for us today, you know, air, air, quotes. air quotes, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, Gentlemen, I think this was a really important conversation. And to our audience, everybody who's, you know, had something to do with GWAT, I think it's a good idea to take some time to get the people close to you around and talk. We don't want this all bottled up. We want to have these conversations. These are healthy things. And if you want to email us and share how you're feeling, we're here to listen. If you want to reach out to us on social media, whatever. It's important to have these conversations because we are family. That's one thing I love about this Air Force family is we're there for each other. And, you know, I'll say that that also gives me hope because of the amazing people I get to serve with every day. That's all I got, Colin. Awesome. Thanks, Rain. Thanks, Reed. I really appreciate the conversation and hope that it's not the last conversation that we get to have together on any number of topics. 
let's have hope for the future that regardless of what comes our way, we're going to come out on top because we're going to be the best leaders we can be. And we're surrounded by smart, good people. Thanks. Awesome. Hey, that'll do it. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Commission Ed. Thank you.